Um, so Lisa, thank you for doing this for us. Uh, for those who don't know, Lisa is with United Soccer Coaching and she is the director over um, all of goalkeeping um, on that side. Uh, it's been a while since I we've worked together. I was out there, oh, it's been about 10 years since I did the advanced national course um, out in Florida with you and Tony. Um, I remember that very well, like it was yesterday. It's one of my favorite courses I've ever done. Um, so Lisa has a, a wealth of knowledge. She's worked in the women's game here in the United States quite a bit. Uh, last team you were with, what, was it Spirit? Yeah, with the Washington Spirit. Last. Spirit. Um, currently out in Antigua right now, working with the, the women's uh, group out there over basically everything from top to bottom, sounds like. Um, so Lisa, thank you for coming on tonight and uh, working with our, our coaches here. Yeah, no problem. So I'll just, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I put together, I, I thought maybe we try to be a little bit interactive, but also just give you some things that um, I have as well. So let's see, let's go from the start rather than the end. So first of all, I just thought, talk about integrating the goalkeeper into the um, team a little bit and some of the considerations you guys need to think about and talk about. Um, so the first thing is just the modern goalkeeper um, that's thrown around a ton um, about what that means. And we talk a lot about um, what that means for the goalkeeper, what the goalkeeper needs to look like. You know, they need to be more athletic. They need to be better with their feet, all of these things. But we don't <laughs> – the modern goalkeeper also needs a modern coach. Um, so they're no longer just shot stoppers, um, but an integral part of how their teams play. So they need to be included in team training. Um, in order for us to effectively see them play the way we want them to play in the game. Um, and I would almost say, and I've challenged um, goalkeeper coaches that, that I'm around, and um, we've talked about this at the highest levels of the game, that goalkeeper coaches need to be coaches first and goalkeeper specialists almost second now. Where in the past, we were goalkeeper specialists. And then if we could, if we could incorporate the defenders or if we knew a little bit about the game and that was a bonus, but now we, we need to know the game. We need to know how things um, move forward. So I think that's a really important distinguish uh, thing to distinguish, especially in young goalkeeper coaches, um, because there was a time we were almost like strength and conditioning coaches, right? Like we were, we were over in the side, we worked in our own little area and then maybe we came out and integrated on the field a little bit um, at times that, that, that those days are over. So I think um, that's a really important distinguish to make to say, hey, we need to know the game. We need to be having regular conversations with our goalkeeper, um, goalkeepers in relation to the game, not just about shot stopping, keeping the ball at the net, although that still is our primary responsibility. Um, so this is just from uh, Todd Hufford. He's um, actually out um, at Real Salt Lake. And this was from an MLS season. So actions of goalkeepers in games. And I would challenge you to almost do this with your, um, at every level you have in the club, is some, get someone to take uh, stats over a period of time. How many times is a goalkeeper playing the ball with their feet? How many times is a goalkeeper distributing? And then when are they making catches and how are those catches coming from? So 85% of what they do in the game is with their feet or some type of distribution. So just take that in for a minute. And then of the saves, so of that small percentage of saves made, they came from shots within their bubble. So within just sliding right, sliding left, right in there where they could come. So 40% came from that just basic handling. And then 27% of what they did came from crosses, and then 20% was those flashy dives that we all like to, um, of course, train. And then 13% for 1v1 situations. So if you think about what you're training or what you're spending time doing, how does that then relate to the game, I think is something to really look at. And I would challenge, I would challenge you, just before we go to the next thing, I would challenge you to think about um, – at each level of the game as well. Because I think if you took um, like a 7v7 game or a lower level game, the number of things that are coming from crosses is going to be significantly lower. Um, you know, maybe 1v1s would go up a little bit because there's more defensive breakdowns. So try to really think about 
um, your players' games and who you coach. I wanted to make this a little interactive, so I thought um, when we think about integrating the goalkeeper into the game, this here is a pretty easy, like the goalkeepers are the black guys here here in the mi middle. They're just playing 6v6, six six and they're in um, – in possession with the player on um, with the ball, right? So uh, I don't know if somebody wants to jump in. You guys can raise your hand or just turn on, on your mics. But talk about like what what are the benefits of this happening? I guess what would be the benefits of this happening? Well, I think just kind of what you were saying in the slide before that they're using their feet a lot when even when they're playing goalkeeper. You know, this is helping them really get comfortable touching the ball with their feet, being comfortable, seeing the field. I mean, obviously lots of benefits, but I think that's the first one I thought of. Yeah, some others from anybody else? Yeah, I think probably just awareness too. They have to constantly, I mean, same thing, the rasking field players, knowing where the ball is, where it's going to go next, what are their angles in accordance to where the ball is, and, and what's their body shape have to look like matching up to that. Yeah, good. Right. And they're definitely a part of it. I think, you know, sometimes you could put one goalkeeper on one team and one goalkeeper on the other team. Um, and, and then there'd be some pluses and minuses to that too. What, what in this exercise though, with them as plus players are maybe some of the things that aren't as good in this exercise? Like what do you see as some of the liabilities maybe based on the I think, position? I think the big one, it's a 360 yep. where, you know, goalkeeping is a 90 degree or I guess 180 view most of the time we're here we're asking him to be a 360 player yeah exactly so when you're thinking about integrating this is not bad this is better than nothing for sure right to have them integrated there's good positive things that are happening with this they'll enjoy it a little bit they get to push and shove with their teammates a little bit um, maybe show off some of their field skills too but um if we just go to the next slide what are the main benefits of just doing this here, right? Just pushing the goalkeeper out to the sideline. Now they're the plus player on the end zone or across the zone. Uh, what automatically stands out as the benefits now? Well, now it's more realistic to what they'll, they'll do in the game, right? It's more game-like um, because now they get distributed and like Caitlin was saying, it's more 180, right? And so that way they look right to left and can play and it's more game-like in that sense. Yeah, and I'll do this. Um, it, I think it's great to have them have that extra zone to be outside of the field of play. Um, but I will, a lot of times, once the ball's gone into the goalkeeper, allow pressure. And there may be times when I won't allow them to go and pressure them. And a lot of times that could be for different reasons, you know, maybe level of the goalkeeper, or um, I can put touch limitations on the goalkeeper. Okay, you have to play one or two touch. But based on what you're trying to get out of it, this, this looks more like the game. For, for the goalkeeper's actual position. Um, so I like that a ton. And um, then just just this next activity, um, there's two gates in the end lines here now. Uh, field players are trying to score through this gate here to the right and left of the goalkeeper, right and left of the goalkeeper. Um, and again, they're in a supporting uh, position. So right away, um, now they've got a instead of saying central, they're going to have to move right and left based on where the ball is. So they're really acting in, in support of. So can you see the benefits here or have some comments about the adjustments just made here? No hands are allowed to be made. Um, you can actually leave a goal um, in behind where these balls are. Just put a goal in there. And if they play, if people combine through, they can score on the big goal if the goalkeeper doesn't block these gates or whatever. But just I wanted to show a second or third progression to just get them really engaged. Um, and if they stay central here, they're not going to be in good supporting angles. Um, so they've got to block those gates. Um, any thoughts from you guys on just transitioning to this exercise? What There's one other real benefit to transitioning that um, from this, from the other exercise that I can think of. Anybody kind of spot that? I mean, going along with what you said, just makes it so much more game-like. This, this looks like their natural position, and the relationship between them and the field players would be similar, too. Yeah. 
And yeah, depending on what, who you put in front of them, it could be their back line, their back three, or even if you wanted to go bigger numbers of back four. So they could actually be working with the players they're going to be working yeah. in. in yeah, you're game. building those relationships. Yeah. Hopefully. So on this exercise, Lisa, you're saying that uh, one team can play their feet and another team would then be able to play it through the gates to score? Yeah, so this to, this goalkeeper to your le uh, to your left is with red. So you okay. see they have three center backs there, and then you see on the other end there with uh, blue. So, so they're the, looking way the out there. The big aspect for me then would be the difference between being in possession and out of possession. The differences that you do on the other one, they were always in possession, being able to play the keeper's feet whenever. And now all of a sudden, now the keeper has to deal with being out of possession and what they do. Yeah, exactly. There's transition. So, so perfect. I knew someone would get that. <laughs> All right, great. So you can just see, I, I, I mean, I wasn't sure exactly. It sounds like most of you are goalkeeper coaches, but I wasn't sure exactly the level of how, who I'd be talking to. But I just wanted to show some activities that are easy. There's tons out there that um, have some benefit. And then you can see by making a couple adjustments, you can add uh, significant be uh, benefits for the, the actual position. Um, all right, so just talking about – next thing I just want to talk about is just the qualities today of goalkeepers in these four areas. Um, I guess if somebody could just give me, you know, when you think of – or if everybody could give me one thing, I guess would be the best way to do it. Something technical that you see is a demand of the position at the moment. What work? Yep, good one. Hands, I mean, they have to be technical with, with catching the ball. Yep, and, that, and that's a little bit starting to be a little bit of a lost art, right, with all this blocking we have going on. We've lost a little bit of the fact, hey, you know, that was in your bubble. Just go ahead and catch that. Don't need to block something that's right at you. So, yeah, being able to catch is very important. Um, other things? Ball distribution. Yep, any type of distribution uh, with feet, with hands. Um, being able to start the attack early. What are some things tactically today that we need um, in our goalkeepers from you guys? Um, well, specifically for us in our club, we we build out of the back, right, and we're founded on principles of first line, second line, third line passes. Um, and just having our goalkeepers understand, you know, what playing out of the back looks like, right, when to skip it into our twos and, twos and threes or when to – play to our four or fives or sixes right um you know just understanding you know who's in the positional advantage right if our two's in a second line can can our goalkeeper find our you know with with accuracy use their tactical ability and find that two in the in a second line to go forward um that kind of stuff yeah and really important right right away you're talking about um what ends up being really important today's um, just distribution and then staying in support of that, right? So not after you distribute, you t turning um, off or switching off, but staying involved in um, the team's play. And then physically, what's been the big change? I was um, just on a podcast the other day with someone talking about goalkeeping and um, a former player was saying, yeah, we just always stuck the fat kid in goal. <laughs> or the person last to the field and goal, um, that's significantly changed now. What are the biggest changes um, you think, guys, right now in what you want to see physically out of your goalkeepers? Quick. I think in the past it was always like you, you weren't fast enough to play on the field to go and goal, but now they're, I mean, they've got the fastest feet on the field. Yeah. And agility and ability to jump and much, ag much more agile. Uh, any other things before I fill in? I think speed, and it goes along with tactics, though. Um, goalkeepers aren't necessarily known as the, the fastest players on the team, but with the tactical side of the way a lot of teams play now, the faster your goalkeeper is, it opens a lot of opportunities for you to play maybe a higher defensive line. Um, and so speed comes into play a little bit more often now with goalkeepers with the way coaches kind of like to play tactically. Yeah, for sure. And just, um, I think there was a big, big push here for a while about every goalkeeper being tall and um, being at a certain height. I think that's been a little bit misproven in some, some ways when you have someone like Nick Romando having the career he's having. I think 
you talk about having special strengths and how do you deal with your deficiencies if you're um, not as um, tall or have some things that maybe are weaknesses for you. And I think having super strengths has been really important. And if, I, if I'm quick off my line and I read the game better, then maybe the fact that I'm an inch or two shorter might not have as much of an impact on whether or not I could be successful um, for sure. What do you see on that around uh, about it was like four years ago, I was over at Southampton um, doing a thing with them and they, they shared with us that at basically age 12 or 13, they do testing on all their, their goalkeepers to find out about how high they're, how tall they're going to be. Yeah. And if they're not in the six, three range, they basically cut them out um, yeah. at age like 13. I'd be interested now to go back and see where, whether or not they've kept that up right. because I think um, there are what people have to realize is the truth is that most goalkeepers are going to fall into a certain classification right and they're going to be above six three at that level at the level they're looking to develop True. but um, does that mean that there aren't going to be outliers sure. and are those outliers going to be really special yeah. and I think the truth is is those outliers are often um, really special is watching something on age um, the age effect and all, all that um, earlier too. And they're saying that, you know, late bloomers that make it usually tend to, if they've made it mm -hmm. and continue through the system, they'll usually be the most special players because they've had to go through ad adversity that those other players haven't had to go through. Right. So I'd say the same is true with somebody that's at a, it is, has a disadvantage maybe originally that, um, because of their struggle initially or some of the things they've had to overcome, they've then created super strengths in them in some way that has kept them in the game. So I'd be interested to see that. We're, there's always trends. And so yeah, yeah. I think there was a very, very heavily lended or leaning trend towards, hey, if you're not over going to be over 6'3", you're not going to make it. Yeah. But now yeah. is that readjusted to say, okay, that can't be the only reason we cut a kid. It might be one of the reasons. After that, they had Pickford in goal for England, right? So, obviously, yeah. that whole thing got deep got lost for them. <laughs> exactly. So, um, that that's the 10. And so, that, what I would say as a goalkeeper coach, and you, you guys, as you're identifying people, I think really you shouldn't identify or you should try to keep your pool of goalkeepers as large as possible is what they're saying in general just about uh, talent identification or development is that you should try to keep your pool as big as possible for as long as possible until really after kids have matured or hit their maturation point, you really don't know what they're going to look like, what they're going to be like. So a kid that's a late developer and is going to struggle because not, he's not maybe getting um, stuck in on tackles or ha having to jump out of things a little bit, if you can keep him in your system somehow and find success for him, then um, – later down the road when everything becomes equal from a maturity standpoint, then they may be your special, pl your special player. That's why um, a lot of the youth uh, academies are now looking at larger pools and less team focused training um, and looking at developing a number of players. And also looking about, um, there was some talk in, um, in Scandinavia countries doing um, age group, um, average age, for rather than um, teams that are based on a, an age, like, okay, you're in this age group or this age group, but your average age has to be 12. So you may have some kids that are older. You may have some kids that are younger than 12, Whoa. but it's your average age so that the average age of the team. So then you're just placing players on teams um, based on ability um, and things like that. So there's some neat stuff going on still. And I think, What's happened is everybody <laughs> has realized that when you move the line, so if you go January to, to December, then then the months in the middle suffer, and then in, if you move to the if you move to um, school age, then the middle's at the end. So you're just moving the line of who is um, suffering. So uh, the best, most specialists will say, just keep kids in the game longer for as long as possible. Good training environment and um, then they'll show their colors when they hit that right moment or that right peak. So that's physical. Um, anything else you guys have to add on, on just the physical development? We went a little bit off on a tangent. Sorry. Um, 
so what about psychological? I always kind of break this up into uh, two things. I, I think there's kind of this emotional control piece of it. And then there's this uh, psychological skills of like being a good teammate, understanding mental skills and things like that. But there's also, especially for kids, emotional control, like writing that those ups and downs. So psychologically, what do you want to see right now in your goalkeepers? I think the biggest one would be resiliency, which is so, which is so tricky because, you know, often we're talking, you know, in the youth club, we're talking about little kids and the ability to get scored on and, and be resilient and recognize, you know, their fault in it, but the, the team's fault in it and being able to shake it off. Yeah, that's a good one. That's all that that's also about um, that's why I think for me it's really important that all kids have to play in goal up until a certain age because it creates a sense of empathy right because they're everybody's yeah. going to give up bad goals then in that case um, so if you've been in that situation before your teammates tend to, if your teammates have been in that situation they tend to be a little bit kinder um, but yeah resiliency and bravery um, I think are some things that especially in young goalkeepers is nice to see right other things from you guys i mean i think as they get to older ages um and that's become more of their main position is that like leadership and goal and you know being able to s step up they're the one player that can see the entire field yeah and something that's definitely um i think todd i think for a long time we always thought figured that you know kids were shy or they're less we're not going to be able to fill that position you've seen with Alyssa Nair um we drafted her as a rookie so in Boston when I was in Boston I spent a lot of time working with her and um her journey and who she is today she's still shy she's still like she still has these qualities as a person but her persona on the field changes and that developing that like, okay, when I walk on the field, I get into this place, I need to command my box. I need to have a different uh, presence um, mm. is really important to have players develop. How do you, do you have any suggestions on how to, to develop that better as coaches for us? Yeah, I think for me, what I've found success with is just putting them in situations where they have to speak. And, um, and then for me, it was also about identifying um, because I think, especially for Alyssa when she was a young young pro she was giving information but that information wasn't um, eliciting a response so are you communicating are you getting messaging across if no one responds so just talking isn't isn't the thing you have to actually get a response from the players in front of you and so giving them um, situations where maybe that's the only thing they do so sometimes in that that second activity where they're in beside, I would put the balls um, behind them and they may, they start the, other than starting the game and being a pass back option at times, really they're managing, um, you guys have all played a three goal game. So it's, you put three goals there as well. So there's three goals across. So they're really just starting the play every time, but they, they can't help protect the goals, but they have to organize someone to protect the goals. And so there's cost if they don't protect. They have to know the score. And if they don't know the score, then their, um, their team loses a point. So things where you put consequences on them for not being engaged in the game, for not having good distribution and those type of things, I think will help them and maybe help their teammates help them get there. Hey, we need, we need you to know the score. We need you to know this. We need you to communicate if we've slid too far to the right slid too far to the left. Um, yeah. I think I found those things have worked a little bit. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Just moving through. Um, I thought this was really good. Just talking about um, goalkeepers, that there's three phases to a save. We always just talk about the save, you know, and um, I think really we have to think about what's going to happen before the save. So all that stuff like communication, um, can I organize in such a way that I eliminate the need to make a save? And the best goalkeepers do that. So when you're thinking about designing a session or when you're thinking about what you want your outcomes to be in a session, I think that should be something to think about is like not just getting the save right, but can I 
do something so well before the save that I've eliminated the opportunity. And then finding that, seeing that yourself and praising that um, would be really important. Is that, like, hey, I, you prevented that from being an opportunity there um, because you were able to tuck somebody in or things like that. And then obviously there's the, of course, the save. I'm going to just talk before the save. This is, um, I checked, just talking about positioning. Um, all the video is not relevant, but I thought for sure the first video is relevant. And I feel like maybe um, you can take something from it. So I'll just play it. Here. If you see at the camera, there is a big difference. If I'm standing here and look how much space you see on each side of my body and hands. If you have time to narrow the angle, if you have the same shot and I do this, I'm literally covering the goal. Second thing is that when you get set, you need to have the right position. If you, if you get set like this, you will never be able to go back up because you are too low. So you would probably cover low space, but it, it blocks your feet and legs so that you, know, you can only use your hands because it's very difficult with such a low position. If you, on the other hand, if you stay too high, it will be very difficult for you to go for the shot which is low. So you, you should have like a nice position where you are set. You have your active hands, not too low, not too high. You have active hands in front of you that you can see them and you can use them. And you are in the right position to make a safe high or to make a safe low. So there is a lot of things you can work on and think of because every little detail can make a big difference. Just talking about before the save, set position and just positioning in uh, general. If you see, if you uh, see at the so then talking about the save, um, we're not going to talk actually about the save too much because I feel like that's, that's the meat and um, that, that's the reaction. We, we train the save so much, you know, slide over here, make this diving safe, slide over here. I mean, everybody loves to train um, and goalkeepers love it. We love it. Putting the ball in the corner, making that big top hand save, those type of things are really important. Um, but the next thing I really want to get into is then after the save, that before the save and after the save need to become more important in just how we develop our training sessions and how we talk to goalkeepers, that these things are just as important. Um, this is from Andrew Sparks. I don't know, was Andrew on your course maybe? He was, actually, yeah. Was. So um, he, this is some stuff from him. He's now at Swansea and um, talking about distribution. And I wanted to show you this because I think that FA has actually come up with this and he's adapted it from Swansea. Hopefully you've maybe seen this. It's been going around a little bit. But talking about playing around, playing through, um, and the different ways that goalkeepers are engaged in the game. So here goalkeeper just distributes out. So they're looking to play around. Um, so it doesn't go that side. They go out the other side. So now they've gone through because they've been able to get into that next zone. So you see the goalkeeper, see that guy checks in, they go through, they're able to bypass a line basically when you're talking about playing through. And then you can talk about playing onto, which is a little bit of a bigger um, pass and breaks uh, really into this, into the um, half. You're playing onto, kind of, kind of make sure you skip a line for sure there. And so I, I love that he put these videos. I told him I was going to steal this from him because it's um, the youth game. And I think we don't – too many times we're referencing um, pros doing it. I thought this was good to see youth uh, players doing this. The game, the game has changed, so you're going just for the line's sake. So same ideas. I like that. Can you – just asking goalkeepers to play that pass right now um, isn't something that was happening five years ago. You weren't asking to play to um, a center midfielder check, checking back back to um, goal um, with you. And then this is just playing um, onto, so they're getting they're getting in, um, and it's a little bit more of a through ball taking advantage of those opportunities.
So I just thought some good clips of why it's so important um, for us to realize what happens after the save. They make a save and then now what? Right. And a lot of times I was watching today, um, actually a, a little Twitter uh, thing and they were looking at, um, I'm not going to call out the goalkeeper, but he's a pretty, he's plays in the premier league. They're doing some things and he was catching and tossing the ball to the side, catching, tossing the ball to the side. And I just don't, for me, and um, <laughs> knows this, for me, I just don't understand why we can't make a save in training and have some type of distribution, whether it's just to bowl it out to goal that's sitting there, bowl it out to the waiting defender or a waiting goalkeeper in line or whatever it is. But um, it's the next thing we ask them to do after the save. And too many times it's not a part of our training. Um, and I would argue if you look at these clips, if goalkeepers aren't with the team and aren't in team training, are you going to get these types of results? Are they going to have this type of connection with their team? Really good ball there playing past um, a line. So I think um, when you were taking your advanced uh, national course too, I think Brenda, I would have, I would have told, I think, uh, Maybe Grubber was on that course or he was on the next one after you, but we had a good discussion about the fact that I was um, telling him he had a session set up where the goalkeeper was playing out and they were inside their six the whole time they were playing out. And I, I'll tell you what, this was maybe 10 years ago, and I reamed him. I was like, when does that happen in the game? Why, why in the world do you have your goalkeeper playing inside the six? What are you doing? Yep. Well, this year I'm encouraging people to do that. Because the game has evolved. Do goalkeepers play with the ball in and around their six? I mean, hopefully they're not right in their six, but they do. Often. They do often have the ball in and around their six. So the game has adapted and it has changed, so we have to change. Right. So if something I was adamant and telling him, hey, what are you doing? It, a few years down the line, I'm like, that would have been passing this year. And last year – because – we have to, as goalkeeper coaches, evolve with the game. Right. Um, I like this phase one, two, and three because most everybody who's on right now is is field player, not goalkeeper coach. They're coaches with their teams. And, you know, we talked about uh, communication and those things of working a goalkeeper into, like, possession sessions, right? Yeah. Um, so if we look at one thing that I know every coach on here has done at some point, and that's shooting drills. When we do shooting drills, how often do we think about one and three for the goalkeeper, right? All we think about is two about the save. That's all we think about. They're taking shot after shot. We're not allowing them time beforehand to get set. We're not allowing them time to adjust their positioning. Um, and then afterwards, we're not even allowing usually time for them to deal with rebounds or anything else outside of it. And so as coaches, if we can take the, the phase one and three and make that more important to our goalkeepers in a repetition setting, like a shooting setting. Now all of a sudden we're telling our goalkeepers, you're not just a shot stopper. You're an organizer before it shot stopper. And then you're helping us keep possession after. And we can even build those things into our shooting sessions and making sure that we're keeping that, that mentality the same, no matter what the session looks like. Yeah, really good. I thought, um, I actually stole that from Todd as well, as well because I, I had always I had always thought of those three things in my in my mind, but I'd never um, called it three phases. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he was the first one for me that was like, "Look, there's three saves. There's three phases to making a save: one, two, and three. And I, I did for me, I was like, "Wow, a light bulb went off. That makes it so much easier for people to think about." Is like, okay, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And what are you doing here? Right. That would be simple. Um, I'm on a bit of a cause um, here. I think, um, I mean, obviously you guys know uh, Bar Barcelona is famous for producing great players. And one thing they do in Spain is they play 7v7 all the way up till um, players are uh, 13, 14 years old. And this is um, a championship game here. Um, I wanted to just show a couple different things um, that reference some of the things that uh, we've talked about I want to start a little bit as the game's going on so just 
Hemos hecho aquí el conjunto barcelonista Bernal por parte del Real Madrid. Espectáculo okay. del fútbol so formativo en Barça TV. Final de la uh, media Gold Cup entre el Real Madrid y el Alevina del Fútbol Club, fútbol club Barcelona. Por Fast tanto, in, uh, duelo de la máxima so también en categoría uh, Alevina. Right um, <laughs> what am I going to say? Some of you guys already know. Duelo de la máxima. <laughs> I mean, look at that. Look at the size of that guy, this goalkeeper. So I just thought that was really interesting to see, you know, clearly some of the things they're thinking about when they select their goalkeepers in these age groups is oh, what is the size of the goalkeeper? Um, and this might be just relative age effect too. He, he might be one of those older kids, but this little guy is our captain uh, to the goalkeeper's right. And then this little guy on the uh, left is Really good players. Well, well, so, También en categoría um, Alevines Clásico the, um, en Barça TV, en esta finalísima que se disputa entre el cinco, here. el hijo del Diego Aguado con el cuatro y Margar. So what I really like about the fact that they're still playing 7v7 is I want you guys to pay attention not to the skill of the field players, try to avoid, uh, avoid that, but to really look at the positioning of the goalkeepers. And because the game is smaller and because the, the crosses can happen, so you think about a 13-year-old or 12-year-old trying to hit a cross on a full-size field. What does that – think about that in your mind. What does that look like? I know what it looks like in my club. It doesn't look pretty. It's like uh, by the time it gets the – if it's unopposed and they hit a cross in from the flank. It's like bounce three, four times and dribbling into the box by the time it gets to the goalkeeper. So just watch how when they're playing this game, the through balls that come in, goalkeepers having to have good responses. Con el cinco, Pablo uh, Melero. Con el seis, Carlos Javier Díaz. Y con el siete, Melvin. Un pique. En el banquillo, con el tres, Carón Gómez. Con el ocho, Marcos Diego. Con and this, nueve, Hugo, this, the, Mar, for this el age group, this will be their last year at this. Um, This referee takes like 10 seconds to get the game started, so there we go. But right away, you can see um, there's no – in our games, if you think this is a U14, uh, I guess, game. So if you think about our games, how much is the goalkeeper actually involved in the game? Because the, we're playing on a full field. And then how much are the goalkeepers involved in this game? And so it's a little bit of a – When you can play small-sided, obviously, um, outside of your natural leagues, because we're governed by people that have us in 11v11. But I think it's good to think about why it's important, why it would, what would be the benefits, especially for the goalkeeper position, if, if we played in smaller spaces for a longer period of time. You can tell the nerves in a final there. I just kicked it out of bounds. So there's a good moment coming up here. I'll let you watch it and then uh, go on. Y hay balón para el Real Madrid. Primer minuto de la final con empate a cero. Esta media gol cap. Por la banda izquierda. Lo intentaba Diego Aguado. So think of a think of a corner at this age. What, how, what are you guys? Most of you guys doing on corners at this age? Real Madrid. Sure, they can't kick them. Yeah, they can't get it into the box, right? So a lot of times, especially in the girls game, you're playing short. Look at that. That's in there. That's that's a ball that the goalkeeper or the defenders have to maybe potentially deal with. Ball comes out on a break. Do we ever see fast breaks like this off of a corner in our in our in our the game that we play right now? Not always because the field is so big um, that especially for goalkeeper development. Um, they're just not involved in the game enough. And I think that might be also why we, um, some of our best athletes don't want to play in goal all the time. Uh, it gets a bit boring if you're on a good team, um, especially. And it can be a bit daunting if you are in another game. So just um, let you see the set piece and then we'll move on. I can watch these forever, but look at this. So a set piece, you know, probably 18, 20 yards, yards away from the game, actually having to set a real wall. There's a, there's a chance 
because of the size of the goal, this goalkeeper can make the save, right? Um, but if he's playing on an eight by um, 24, then I think this is a harder task for a goalkeeper at this age. No, I think was there. So um, you can find these games with the the Spanish league. They always have a final like this. And um, for me, that it just every time I think about it, I just wish we and now I'm in Antigua. I get to design what the youth program is going to look like. So they're going to play seven v seven until they're um, older. I, I just think, especially for the goalkeeping position, um, there's a lot of benefits. Um, to staying small-sided longer. So think about that when you're uh, designing training sessions and doing things. Can you play smaller-sided games, especially during those non-competitive periods of time during the year? I don't know if you guys have uh, some thoughts or things to add to that before we just go on here. I mean, so you shared earlier this uh, yeah, so uh, from Todd. Was it 27% at the kind of professional level? They're dealing with crosses 27% of the time. Um, on balls that they're receiving. And then I think I saw another stat earlier today that said at like U10, I think that stat was below 10%, right? So yeah. we're, we're asking these kids at older ages to deal with crosses and they really haven't seen crosses since they were like ever, right? And now all of a sudden you, you shrink up the field and the numbers and now they're seeing crosses. And it's one of the areas that keepers struggle with the most is crosses because at a young age, they don't deal with having to read it at all. Yeah, and I, I get this from field player co coaches all the time. They're like, well, why are they so bad at this? Why are they so bad at that? Because literally it's not a part of their game until 15, 16. Yeah. Because at 15 and 16, now a guy or a girl can get a cross in. So how am I supposed to have developed that expertise in dealing with crosses when I haven't seen it in game-like situations? Yeah. You know, so it's something to think about. Um, and I, for me, the best solution would be for us to stay small-sided longer. And there would be benefits for field players as well. Um, maybe I'll try to start that revolution at some point. But <laughs> right now I have too many things on my uh, plate. But I, what I've been saying to clubs is then can you find ways to add small-sided opportunities to um, your environment? whether it be within training or summer programming where you're doing, you know, like a Friday night lights thing, come out and play for fun, but everything's 77 um, because it will just help um, the goalkeepers develop um, in those areas. And listen, we, we all like to get to goal sooner, right? I know there's no player that says, Hey, if I can get to the goal with five or six pa passes rather than having a sprint a full, full field, they're going to complain. It's more touches for field players. Um, so it's more dynamic actions. There's lots of reasons to do it. So um, Caitlin, just a lot I would throw this idea out. Just uh, what what's what's the thought, Caitlin, of doing seven v seven mini tournaments? You know, an age group grabs their team, they split it in half. You get four other clubs to bring in four different teams, and rather than going off and doing more eleven side tournaments, you just do some mini tournaments local, and you just get high level competition within small spaces. So funny you just said that right before you said that Maddie sent me a text to say let's run a 7v7 tournament. Yeah why not? That's yeah, great. I, mean, you know, I was out at a scrimmage today one of the coaches that was on this so, uh, our 07s and our 08s playing 11v11 the whole time I kept looking I'm thinking this is th these kids are too little to play 11v11. I mean they're not even getting reps. Right. I mean it, th there was one kid with, you know, on the left side, I'm like, I don't even think he's touched the ball in the 10 minutes I've watched this. Yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate. It's, we, wonder why, we wonder why kids are leaving the game, right? We wonder Boring. why. Totally. Boring. And they're leaving right when they go up to bigger field size, right? Like the field is so big for this kid who's moving up and he's like, well, I'm never going to touch the ball or see the ball if I'm on this side and it's 100 yards away. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't stay in wide positions because there's no point to stay in wide positions. The ball is never yeah, going to get the ball. There. So, yeah, so many principles of the game were ruining because of the, the field size we have them on is um, 
not right for the, where they are. And I would encourage you to um, grab the seven by the, those set, the smaller set, those seven by seven size fields. What, like, what are they? Seven by 22, I think. Those smaller goals and put them on the fields too, because that, think about it. I, if I go and I make a great top hand save on that feet, on the goal keep, on the goal that that kid's playing on, he makes that save. But if it's an eight by 24, he doesn't make the save. Right. Because it's just the goal is too big for him as well. So I think trying to put them in those um, advantages. And then what does that also do for the shooter? Quality of a uh, shooter. You have to be better because a lot of times you were, you're almost unopposed when you're shooting because of, you've got this little tiny kid in goal and you're just shooting, you're almost shooting on an open goal. So when shooters have to deal with um, putting it in the right places, I think that's important too. So just when you think about designing your training sessions, I think um, a bit the huge thing for me is um, who is it for? Um, and again, what, what does their game look like? So matches the demands of their game. Um, think about the three phases of a save. save. So are you giving them an opportunity to make the decisions and do the organization and things that they need to do before the save? Or are they just getting bombarded with a ball every five seconds, they don't have time for that first phase? And then are you demanding after they make the save um, to, to then have that response, to have a good distribution? And it can be, it, it can be as simple as playing out to an open goal or an alternate goalkeeper or something like that. But have distribution be a part of what they do after the save. And then any time there's a rebound, that ball needs to be live. Even a lot of times for me, just in the best interest of time, I'll say, okay, it's one touch. So if it bounces out to me, I hit it one touch. It bounces out to somebody else, they, they hit it one touch. Um, so the goalkeeper, if they spill it, they have to get up, and there's repercussions for that. Um, that is that. And then um, just think about decisions and distribution being a part of being misspelled. I, I, with the regional team, I misspell something on every slide, and they have to catch it. So you, I, did, I just did that for you guys as well, apparently. Um, so you, um, but just, is there a decision? Because there's too many activities where I, I go, I, I come in with the cross, I go and I distribute out here. I, the ball comes always from a breakaway. The ball always comes from here. Like, is there a decision I have to make? Um, and then make sure distribution's it. And that's kind of what I had for you. I did, I, I figured we'd do Q and A after that. I didn't, I didn't know if I hit everything you wanted to talk about. Um, but that was my general thoughts when, um, with the time we had. So I guess I'll just open up to Q and A or other thoughts, questions. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, I have one that I've been thinking about is, it, and I think you kind of touched on it, but I didn't really get a clear answer in my simple brain is what age do we, do we specialize? What age do we say, hey, you're, you're going to be a goalkeeper. Yeah, for me, I think you'll start to have people lean towards goalkeeping around 12, 13, 14. But for me, I'm not until 14, 15. Because they have to, I think, one, if they still, if they have to do a half in goal and a half on the field, I think that benefits them right? Because they're going to be a better field player. They're going to be a better goalkeeper because of both of those things. Yeah. And for me, I know there's kids out there that at 12 think they're just going to be a goalkeeper, but I think they won't understand the game as well if we don't require them, not in big games. So if they're our best goalkeeper and we've got to play state cup final, whatever, which is another topic of why we're doing that at 12. But um, I think there, there's – we all want to win, right? We so in those yeah. moments, we we want to win. But I think there's opportunities to find um, to make. I've lost league games because we put our second goalkeeper in goal. I'm okay with that because it ultimately helps us develop as a goal as a club. And you're only good if you get experience. So experience on the field, experience in goal is important. Um, and I just do. I think the benefits of being able if. 85% of what you're going to do is with your feet or distribution. And you look, especially at our games with the size of the games that we play, what is How many times is the goalkeeper even touching the ball in our games with the right. size? So, 
So for me, you're just losing. I, I don't know. That's my personal opinion. I just don't, I don't see the benefits of having a goalkeeper specializing until they're 14 or 15. Um, and you may at 13 and 14 lean towards two or three goalkeepers, but um, at 12, I'm still making all my boys play in goal, my boys and girls, they have to rotate through. Uh, maybe there's one or two that doesn't because you can tell they're not into it and it's going to um, have harm, create harm because they're traumatized with getting hit with a ball. But I do, I do think having everybody playing goal creates empathy for the goalkeeping position too when there's mistakes made. So I think the pressure of that position and that it's not a ball rolling towards you with traffic in front of you and you making the save isn't as easy as they think. You know, it just isn't as easy as they think. So Yeah. It's good. Um, I have another question, if you guys yep. don't mind. Um, talk to me about your thoughts on having one or two goalkeepers on a team. So I feel like this is something that's always interesting, right, is that we have, you know, 15-year-olds that have never been challenged. So – so they don't show up to training, but they know they're going to start on Saturday's match because they're the only goalkeeper. Yeah. And how, I, I, when yeah, you integrate that, that, I mean, it's such a tricky thing. And I feel like we run into it every single year. Yeah. I think that's the other reason to force um, people to play and go longer, like to have there be a rotation and go longer because you'll create more goalkeepers. You'll create more opportunities that way. And I think um, that, that, that's a problem. We have, I have that problem right now in my club. I only have one goalkeeper for our oldest team, and it's one of our better teams, and she's not good. And she's not yeah. going to get better until we go find somebody. So we're actually having to go and recruit. But um, the area I'm from, it's the only position she's played to. And I feel a little bit bad because she's a soccer player, and, um, like, she identifies, I'm a goalkeeper, I'm this. And I think when she hits high school this year, um, she's in for a rude awakening because she – she hasn't developed because she's had zero competition and um, she hasn't developed the skill she needs from a foot uh, perspective because um, she hasn't played on the field enough. So again, maybe we lose some games early on, but we develop better product down the road. And I think that's what we have to think about is what do we want our product to be at the end and not what do we want our product to be today? And uh, when you think about it that way, way you make different decisions to say okay well I'm okay making um having some mistakes or losing some games or you know giving more opportunities to people because down the road that'll provide us with a, a better um goalkeeper and goal and I think you'll, if you have goalkeepers rotating in then you you may be able to say hey well I'm gonna go ahead and I know you want to be our goalkeeper but I'm gonna go ahead and play so-and-so um, instead, and that might be a wake-up call for them. Yeah. Important. It's good. important competition. Yeah, so I, th I think, I mean, just summing up the two questions, it's starting multiple young and, and the whole team, so you develop a couple that could do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, if you only develop one, then you're stuck with one, <laughs> you know? Yeah, then so integrating that second one is just a fight. It's like you – I mean, I, I coach a 2008 team, and the girls – I've only had one and I bring one to training to possibly make, you know, bring a second one on the team and they have like a whole, full on heart attack. Of course. And I think that's so wrong. I mean, it's so wrong that, you know, she's only 12 and she's specialized and we only have one and she's not pushed and trying to figure out how to bring in a second one. It's, it's, we did her a disservice when they, when she got specialized as a goalkeeper, super young. Yep. So now you're fixing a problem that if you have a philosophy from the beginning, uh, totally solved already. So. Yeah. You know, anything else? Yeah, I, I have a question and actually it's kind of like a multiple questions, like one leading on the other. So I'll try to like put it together, but I think most of us on here kind of like Brandon mentioned are, I, I'm not like a specialized goalkeeper coach. And that's one thing that I've tried to increase as a coach is being able to learn goalkeeping more. Um, but like as a, as a coach of a team, how young and how often should we be pushing for goalkeepers to go do like individual goalkeeper training? And then kind of another question off of that is, should we be planning some of our sessions around, you know, just, goalkeeping and the goalkeeper position and building out of the back end, that type of a thing. 
Yeah, I, well, first of all, I think um, building out of the back is the easy one, um, that you should play games that build out of the back at a very young age and start to – and where they can even rotate the positions they're in, right, so um, that everybody ends up playing in goal for a turn. So I have the responsibility. I make a save or I take the goal kick, and now I've got to play out and then be in that support position. And if it turns yeah. over, then I've got to make the save. And um, – so I think that's important is that you are doing sessions um, to play on the back because there's so many times I, I run a youth club in state college as well. Like a, I run two youth clubs, one, one that's just a rec program and one that's a little bit higher level. And for me, that's part of our curriculum is every two weeks or three weeks, they're getting a playing out of the back kind of session because it's yeah. so, if you get stuck in that moment in the game, U10 or U12, then you're stuck. Then you're just giving up goal after goal after goal, um, yeah. or you're having to concede and just punt long. So I think those things are important. And for me, with our specialists, the way we do it is we let the goalkeeper, the parents and the goalkeepers know, or the kids know, this is your weekend goal. Okay. So this weekend, your these two kids are playing in goal. Or, three kids are playing goal and how, depending on how the coach breaks it, breaks up the um, time. So that week we tell them, Hey, goalkeeper trainings this week, we have some kids that want to play in goal all the time. And so they'll always go to the goalkeeper training, but right at that age, we do goalkeeper training once a week. So at U10 and U12, um, we do once a week goalkeeper training. So if it's their week, we tell them we need you to go. Um, we also do, we also have a, at the beginning of the season, have a session where everybody gets the basics in goalkeeping. So we don't show up at the first game and go, okay, let's play. Somebody has, oh no, somebody needs to play in goal. We, we have a session early in the season that's on just basic handling and catching. And we, and it be, it's one of their favorite sessions now because we do the intro to goalkeeping and then we do activities that have them rotating in goal, you know, so like, you shoot, you save, and then you become the cat. Like, you know, activities yeah. rotate in and out of goal. Um, so they get to show off their goalkeeping skills and, and they like have been taught a little bit. And it's become, hey, when are we going to do our, our goalkeeping finishing session? And they always know it's coming. I think we do it a week or two before the first games. And they always know it's coming and they're excited about it. You know, when do we get to do that? It's fun. So yeah. taking the fear out of goalkeeping is something that's important. Um, making it something that everybody does. Everybody defends. Everybody, play, everybody plays a defending position. Everybody gets to play an attacking position. Everybody gets to play in goal. Yeah. And even how you word it, gets to rather than has to, you know. So everybody yeah. gets an opportunity. So is important. And the, getting the parents to buy in. They'll, they'll do a lot of the work for you if you, um, you know, get them on board early. Yeah. That's awesome for those younger ages. That's, that's huge. Thank you for that advice. You look at some of the best goalkeepers in the world. I didn't play, I didn't play permanently in goal until I was in, well, I didn't play permanently in goal until I was in college. In high school, I was our primary goalkeeper, but I still played on the field some. So for me, that, that's how, and you look, Hope Solo was the same way. Um, you look at some of the top, top goalkeepers in Europe, they'll say the same team thing, uh, top, um, I don't think um, Howard, Howard played some other sports until he was older, so he wasn't a goalkeeper really until 14, 15. So if we know that we're not developing the best goalkeepers in the world until 14, 15, why are we in a rush to have goal goalkeepers at 8, 9, and 10? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. All right, anything else? Coaches, any other questions you guys have for your training sessions with your goalkeepers? That was awesome, Lisa. We really appreciate it. Thanks a ton. That was excellent. Thank you. Always fun to talk goalkeeping. <laughs> Lisa, I appreciate it. Um, hopefully you're staying safe and warm down there in the Caribbean. Enjoying yeah, the weather. Always. Okay. Thank you, coaches, for hopping on. We appreciate you guys being with us tonight. Um, I know you guys all probably were out at practice, so appreciate you guys jumping on as well. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon.
Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Thanks. Brandon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lisa, we'll talk to you soon. All right, bye.